I do act not just as a doula, but as an advocate, as a community member, as a translator, as a point of contact, a point of reference. A lot of my community and the people that I serve, their first language also isn't English. And so we find ourselves needing people to translate documents and to have a familiar face in settings where it can be very sterile. I do a lot, not just the the typical, what we, what people think the typical work is, right? Like sitting bedside and all that. I do very little of that. It's more um, the practical and logistic aspect that I serve in. It's a big thing, right? It's not just one, one thing or the other. It can go anywhere from translating documents into different languages like Spanish, whatever. It can go um, from going with people to the funeral homes to kind of decide what it is that they want, what kind of service they want. It can be talking directly to consulates when we're repatriating bodies to different countries. It can be advocating for people who were killed by way of violence or police brutality is something we see a lot in my community. I do enjoy sitting bedside and I do enjoy getting to meet clients who have had a terminal diagnosis and who want me there for the whole thing. However, just due to the the circumstances that my people live in, that's not really something that I get to do very often. I get a lot of questions about like how people like how to get started in this industry and how to be successful in this industry. And it's really complicated because this is such exhausting work, you know, like mentally and emotionally and physically, it can be really taxing. I do some like death doula education as well. So when I talk to my students, I always tell them like, it's important that you focus on yourself and that you take time to prioritize your care or whatever, but it can get so complicated. <laughs> To actually do that when there is, like we were talking about, this sense of urgency, like somebody is actively dying, I need to be there, I need to support, I need to do all these things. It can be very lonely work when you are constantly focusing on putting out little fires for other people. Um, any care work, I guess, can be seen like that. However, I know that for me personally, there has been instances and and I've just, you know, recently been through these instances where I cannot do anything after like a certain death or after a certain situation, like I will be paralyzed for like a month where I just need time to really go back to myself and figure out like what the hell happened. So I think that when we go into death work or grief work or anything like that, it's really important to also focus on like self-care, mental health and physical health and how that kind of all ties together to make a, a one person who can pour from a cup that is filled and not one that is constantly empty. I don't think that people need a certification in order to do this kind of work because it is deeply ancestral work and it's work that we've been doing for millennia as humans. I think that the reason why this is booming um, is because over the past you know, 100, 200 years, death has been so medicalized and it's been so sterilized and we don't really have those connections that we used to have right we used to have bodies in our in our homes and we used to do home funerals and and home vigils and all of those things were incredibly normal until the rise of the modern funeral industry and embalming and all of those things I think it becomes a bit complicated when you start talking about like specific types of work that people do right do I think that people should be certified and or at least trauma informed if they're going to be working with populations who are suffering greatly with specific types of trauma absolutely however i'm also of the belief that a lot of the educational systems that we see in america and around the world you don't see people like me right in western education you see diagrams of white bodies and of white diseases and and of the way it affects white men but because of that you don't typically feel comfortable in an educated environment like that or in or, or in in academia so it's complicated do i think that people should need a certification no do i wish that if they wanted to get one they could absolutely but it's so multi-layered i think most of my experiences came from recognizing that death is very different across the world the way that death is handled in my home country in mexico is exponentially different than the way it's handled here in america and there's just so many processes and and so many bureaucratic things that I had no idea that had to be done. I learned those and and that was very complicated for me because it seems that no matter what you do in America, it's always a huge process, right? There's always paperwork. There's always a million things that need to be done. And at the end of the day, it still doesn't ever feel quite done. So that was that was a lot for me to learn when I was first starting out. But I think that because I was so young, 
I was able to pick it up rather quickly. And and I was, I've been gifted with like the ease of making friends. So I, I was able to make some really close alliances and build community for people to explain things to me that maybe I didn't quite understand. That was the biggest thing for me, like a huge culture shock, not only in the way that things are handled practically, but also just like the way that grief looks in America that was very different to me. And it was, it was shocking. And I knew that I'm glad that I got to see that, but I don't think that that's the kind of experience that I would want to have. A lot of things could be solved with a conversation. Like I think that 99% of the world's problems could be solved with a conversation, but humans are these impeccably capable and scared little things, right? Where we're completely terrified of things that we don't understand And so we occupy our minds with things that we think are successful. We say, oh, you know, that's an eventuality that I I won't have to face for a long time. I can focus on this. And and maybe if I make something of myself, maybe that'll be less unpleasant. Or maybe I don't have to think about it. Or maybe I can avoid it. But at the end of the day, like, we're all going to die. There's still that part of us in the U.S. and in polite society that says, oh, we're not supposed to talk about certain things. Or we're not supposed to do certain things. But there is that that unwavering human curiosity that's like, no, I do want to talk about this. I'm scared or I'm this or I'm that. I find that the best way, for me at least, is just to like leave the door open. I've been told that I have one of those faces that you just want to tell things to. And so it's nice to bring up like, hi, my name is Lupe. I work in death care. Reach out if you have any questions or or let me know if you want to talk about something. And then people are like, oh, oh, absolutely. And, and they start thinking or even if they don't necessarily talk to me, at least then they're thinking about it and then they'll talk to their trusted people and then those conversations will begin. So just creating a space and leaving the door open is the best thing that you can do. One of the things that we say here is is meet people where they are and show up for people where they are. And that kind of directs where I need to go based on what the client is not only telling me um, verbally, but like what they're physical cues are, what their paperwork might look like, what their values are, what their families are saying. It's all built up on a, on a process of like conversations and trust, right? So they will tell me what they need and I'll show up and then I'll be like, Hey, these are my boundaries. These are my values. And we go from there. Once a patient, the person dying can no longer communicate in traditional ways. How do you get in consent from them and advocate for them in this way that they want? That's when um, advanced directives and medical healthcare proxies really come into play. I do my best to make sure that my clients have written and detailed accounts of what they want. We spend many weeks and months talking about these things and writing them down and making sure that we sort of think of every eventuality. And if they are no longer able to tell me what they want, then their healthcare proxy, somebody who has been chosen to make the decisions for them, that's when they step in and that's when they start making the choices. Do people grieve different types of deaths differently in your experience? Absolutely. I think that it really is very circumstantial. If it's a very sudden death, you don't have any time to really process what's going on or you don't have a lot of time to process that you could have even lost that person, right? I think with a death of natural causes of old age or of disease, sometimes you get a little bit of time for your body to be like, okay, this is coming. But if it's just somebody who who dies um via violence or or a sudden death or or dies by suicide, you don't get an opportunity to even think like, oh, something was wrong or something could have happened. There's been a lot of instances where a lot of the young men in my community have died by police brutality and it you just, you never get prepared. You know, you live in this constant fear and this constant anxiety, like when is the next one coming? But that doesn't mean that you're necessarily prepared for the grief or the loss, right? Um, You're just prepared to be bombarded again. So that's very complicated. And I think that we also, proximity is a huge issue here in, in, in grief, right? If somebody is in this country and another person dies and there's no way to go see them in another country, that grief is very complicated. There isn't that closure that sometimes we need um, in order to get through it. You don't have the 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 funeral and the big celebration to to let your heart do what it needs to do, and that's very complicated. It's very very hard. You know, there's also different types of grief. You know, grief with divorce, grief with immigration, grief with um, disappointment, anything like that. A loss is a loss is a loss, and the body, from my understanding, processes it the same way. Not necessarily like in the same style, 
but you deal, you still feel it, right? Like there is this loss of what could have been a loss of what was, and that's, that's huge. I know a lot of really incredible death workers who do like divorce grieving and who do like death dueling for, for divorces and for relationships and for jobs and things like that. And I'm so grateful that we have that because death really isn't the only type of grief out there. And I do also wish that there were more studies out there to help us talk about it. Um, but there just isn't. And the only thing that we have right now is just like mutual support and understanding. I don't think that any loss should be less significant just because it was like of a job or a marriage or a pet, you know, that still, that still is really painful. And we deserve to have time to, to honor the way it changed our lives and the way it changed our hearts. Do you ever deal with children and their grief? And what does that look like? And does it differ? Children have such a sense of justice that I think that we lose as adults because we know that things just aren't fair sometimes. I think for kids, when they experience grief and when they experience loss, they have a really hard time making sense of it. They say, you know, why did that happen if this was a good person? Or why did something so awful happen to people who already have bad things happening for them? And you have to, at that point, you just kind of have to sit there and be like, bad things don't necessarily happen to bad people. Good things don't necessarily happen to good people. Emotions aren't good or bad. They just are. And those are concepts that are very, very big. And those are things that a lot of kids really struggle to comprehend. But then there's such a like a there's such like a grace that I think children have as well. And such a I wouldn't say resilience because I think resilience can be kind of a condescending word. Um, But they just have such a way of being able to bounce back from things if they are held properly and if they are allowed to explore the depths of their emotions a lot of people brush off children's emotions because they're children and they think that they're insignificant and they think that they don't matter. But those are like the formative years, right? Like that is how a child will learn to deal with grief for the rest of their lives. I really like the the way that children are constantly curious and they need answers in order to make sense of the world, right? So when they do ask those questions like, is she coming back or is is grandpa in pain or or whatever, you know, like, will I ever see my mom again? Those kinds of questions are like, oh my God, you know, like we're really grappling with the, with, with mortality in such a way that I don't know how to explain to this kid, but honesty is always the best policy I have found. And like you said, kids learn through example. So it's, it's really, really great to be able to show them like, hey, I understand that you're having big feelings. Here are some ways that if you want to channel them, you can. Here are some other ways. And if that doesn't feel good, we'll find a way that feels good for you. But one of the crucial things is definitely like not, like you said, being so avoidant and hiding it, not being like, oh, not now. Like we're busy planning. We're busy doing this, whatever, whatever. And like the only time that they actually see the body is like heavily embalmed or not at all. That's really difficult. Um, when you've seen someone in your life 24 seven and suddenly they're gone and you're eight, like, how does that, how does that work? You don't have a sense of like object permanence yet, but then suddenly you start to recognize like, Oh, this is not here anymore. What's going on. The structure of my life has completely changed. And we still have those things as adults, but because we never learned how to deal with them at those young ages, we're still lost at 50, 70 years old. You know, I just love knowing that it's like, you can be, the richest most whatever person in the world and you're still going to end up worm food you know in some way shape or form in some capacity there is still going to be at some point the end for you um and that in itself I think brings me a lot of comfort because that does make me feel like I can live my life in a way that is really for the now, right? Like all I'm worried about right now is being a good person and being honest to myself and recognizing that like, I will make so many mistakes and that's fine. Um, And we don't get that kind of luxury in, in almost any other place in the world, like in our lives, right? We feel like we have to be perfect and wonderful all the time because there's only the expansion of up and up and up and up, right? Like, oh, if I do this, then I'll get this and I'll get this and I'll get this. But with death, it's like, if I live a life, I'm gonna die. I might as well enjoy it and do what I can to be good and feel good. I think that in my perfect world, there's no birth doulas, no death doulas. It's just people who know how to do this. And when that time comes in their life, they come together and they do it for each other. That would be the the goal, 
um, because everybody should have access to this knowledge and everybody should should have the autonomy and 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 should have the the wisdom and strength to be able to do it on their own. I think that the only constant in life is change. So one way or another, it'll change. Um, I think that we have a really special opportunity to just make sure it changes in a way that is beneficial to all of us.